No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today I'm taking a dip into some deep, soft white underbelly lore. You hit me up, you said, do you want to interview the devil? You know why I said that though, yeah? Because you've been smeared in the press as the devil? So Mark, uh, well, first of all, I got canceled, as many people probably know, and um, I was in total shock of what had happened online. And then I asked Mark, because I'm like, my, I'm not a very big influencer or anything on the internet. So I asked Mark, I'm like, do you know anyone that would give me a voice in the situation? Um, and I looked up Mark interviews, and I saw that he interv- that you interviewed him. Uh-huh. And I asked him to connect me to you. And so Mark reaches out to you and says, hey, do you, um, Lima's interested in doing a podcast with you or an interview with you. And then I guess your response was her, was, uh, I know Lima, the devil reincarnated. And then he calls me. You think and he's I like, said that? Yeah, that's what Mark said. So then he tells me, he's like, well, um, I don't. Did I really? Say yeah, that? you responded to him in a text Why would message. I say that? That doesn't sound like something I would say. So, but, well, that's what people were calling me, me on me, the internet. Let me look at my text. Okay, with okay. Mark. So then Mark tells me he's like, "Well, uh, Adam called you the devil. He's not. Doesn't look like he's interested in doing a podcast with you." Oh, I fuck with the devil. This is well known. But then, but then he was like, uh, "But at least you. But at least he knows who you are." <laughs> I can't so then find I emailed, Mark's number I drove Ivan, my husband, crazy for like a good two days. I'm like, I can't believe Adam, who, no shade, is a porn star, is worried about me smearing his reputation. And oh, so then I sent you that email and I said, um, hey, do you want to interview okay. the devil? This is my response to Mark. I said, ha, 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 ha. I saw the video saying she's the devil incarnate. So okay. I did not say... Oh, she is the devil. Which okay, that, okay. that was the part I was like surprised <laughs> by. But when he said this, I had just watched the video basically saying you're the devil. Which, okay, I, I hate to yeah. do a spoiler at the beginning of this. Okay. I've watched the video. I watched part okay. one and part two. Okay. I don't think that they are meant to be. I don't think that they're coming from a place of serious inquiry. Like the, the cancellation of you. I didn't. I, I didn't feel like I heard a lot of strong arguments okay. that you were a bad person or that you were doing diabolical things. Did you Did you see the video that went up on Mark's channel today? No. Ninety nine percent like negative. They hate feedback you on on Mark's video. Oh. Yeah. So, what did Mark say? Well, what oh, was Mark Mark's video me. that came Mark out today? I feel me. like I should have known about Mark this. Mark called but. me. He's like, Lima, don't read the comments. I'm like, Mark, I already did. And he he told me he's like, don't. Um, what is wrong with people? Like, um, I so mean, what do they think that you did? Uh, so a, a long list of things. Um, they think I'm Illuminati. They think I'm MK Ultra. They think that I own rehabs and do. Are you saying those two up front because they're the most obviously ridiculous? Like, because or, yeah. or is that like a large the, percentage of these people biggest, actually think those? Uh, a large percentage of people actually appear to think that. So and this is like a large percentage of the software owned by the audience thinks that people that i mean because they they do the illuminati thing about me too yeah it's just kind of well that's bizarre. why you interviewed me because we're both illuminati that does kind of add up yeah no. <laughs> just kidding <laughs> <laughs> but okay what else but okay are there so, more like serious yeah, type so accusations the biggest or? one is um and i think it's better if i put out the entire story firsthand but yeah, the biggest one some is people saying might not that, know what we're talking about. Yeah, the biggest one is saying I lied about a woman's autopsy report. And why would I possibly lie? It's because I killed her, obviously. So that's that's basically their idea of what um Right. And Be- you know, I didn't lie about it. Because but that's you, a you said story. that there was only Tylenol in her system and then that part got edited out of the interview. That was like one thing that I managed to catch from some of the exposed videos about you that actually sounded like it was interesting. Is that not true? Okay. So uh, when um, should we start from the beginning? Because yeah, we, I think okay, that yeah. everybody's going to be totally lost. This is true. If they if they don't know what exactly happened. Yeah. Okay. So you. Okay. Uh, w- what's your background even before you okay. met Amanda? Okay. So um, growing up. My father was very abusive to my sisters and I, Mm. and, um, you know, 
I don't, I never talk about this stuff. It makes me very uncomfortable, but I feel like a lot of people online treat me like I'm just a robot. Mm. So they use me as a punching bag in their comments. Um, so I think it's important to just kind of be human and share like the experiences, but basically like, um, you know, my father was physically and sexually abusive with my sisters and I, and, um, he would, if we woke up early, he would duct tape us to chairs and, sorry. That's terrible. I'm sorry to hear Duct that. tape our mouth shut. And, um, like, growing up, I always was thinking, like, how are we going to get away from this situation? Or, you know, and I always had really long hair and people would always comment, like, oh, your hair is so pretty. So I'd be thinking, like, you know, I want to hurt my dad and I want to get away from our... Um, I want to get my mom and sisters away from this situation. Right. And then I'd be too scared to do it because I was like five years old. And yeah. I'd go to the, my room and like cut a piece of my hair off and cry about it, you know. And so my mom ended up running away when I was five and my sisters were three. And um, we ended up living in a church in Detroit. And then we moved to Canada. And um, she contracted a lot. She's a software developer. So... Um, I went to 15 elementary schools and eight different high schools, and um, we moved around a lot. I didn't really have, like, any close friends, so... Sorry. <laughs> my sisters were, like, my best friends. And so, fast forward, like, to now, um, like, I went through all the the standard things like you know hanging out with the wrong kids at school um just getting in trouble watching my friends fall apart and then I I kind of decided I was going to change my life and that's what got me interested in mental health but on the other end my sisters didn't remember any of the trauma they were straight A students they were all-star athletes they didn't get into trouble um, they graduated university and went on uh, to move to L.A. to be actresses. They were very successful as actresses. You know, a lot of people in L.A. are actresses, but they're driving for Uber, they're waitressing or whatever. Right. They were actually supporting themselves full, full time. And um, they were doing really well. And then around um, nine years ago, they started hearing voices and um, they went to see a psychiatrist um, and that doctor didn't have any tools to diagnose or treat them. They just said, how are you feeling? And based on my sister's description of their feelings, basically like a blind person trying to describe the color blue, you're um, trying to describe a feeling you've never felt before. Based off of their self-reporting, my sis uh, the psychiatrist d um, diagnosed my sisters, both of them, as schizophrenic, gave them a cocktail of medications, and my sisters developed an addiction to the medications. They were misdiagnosed. Um, four years later, we found out that they had dissociative identity disorder, which is multiple personality disorder. Right. It can't be treated with, with medications. It needs to be treated with specialized therapy. And because of the addiction, we're unable to treat the mental illness. And um, the price of treatment is so expensive because... Um, Insurance, you know, doesn't really rely on self-reporting. Um, they'll they'll kind of go with a one-size-fits-all treatment, so they'll only approve, like, three days for a mental health hold or, if it's an addiction, um, up to 30 days of treatment, and then they release a person. And a lot of times, these people have been self-harming, eating disorders, um, you know, addiction for 15 years or more, and... 30 days in rehab is not enough time to fix a person's behaviors for 15 years. Right. So, um, so yeah, that basically fueled me to start my startup company, which is Aura. Uh -huh. And what we do is essentially use data, so self-reporting, but also other um, aspects, like we do voice analysis, we do biofeedback, um, we analyze the patient's behavior and interactions. It's a telehealth app that um, engages with the patient, kind of tracks how they're doing. Um, and the goal is essentially to extend patients' treatment um, with insurance paying for it. Where did you get the funding to start this business? I raised money from, um, in, I raised a pre-seed round um, 
to start the company okay from investors right yeah and so and, okay and so then how do you get in touch with mark or is there anything so, significant in between that we should cover? yeah okay. yeah so okay um i started the company in 2019 but before that i you know i've been doing this for since 2014 i had the idea but uh-huh. I didn't really know anything about business except for the shark shark tank, watching Shark Tank in Canada. Right. So in my world, you know, I have a great idea. Wait, so you grew up in Canada? Did we not even touch on exactly where you grew up? I I grew up all over, oh, but okay. uh, Toronto and then Ottawa and then Montreal and then LA. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So um all over the place. But essentially, um I can't remember what your previous question was. Um, oh, the business, you started it in 2019. Yeah, I started it, but, you know, I had an idea. I really didn't know anything about business. And then I would watch Shark Tank all the time in Canada. And um, there was an event in L.A. that was a panel of investors, and you go pitch them. And um, it was $80 for the ticket. And for me, I was like, oh, my God, $80 is so cheap for someone to write me a big check to start my business. Right. And because I thought you just have to have a good idea and then someone's going to write a check and help you build it. Right. And um, and so I paid for my ticket, went to the event, pitched my idea. um, And uh, everyone was like, you know that's so amazing. That's so great. And I was so excited. And then there was this one guy, Tyler and one of the investors. And I asked him, I'm like, Tyler, what did you think of my, you know, pitch? Cause you only have 60 seconds. So you pay $80, but you only get 60 seconds to pitch them. Uh-huh. And then, um, he looked at me and he was like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, first you have to log in. And then he was like, no, what, like, what do you do? And I, I told him, I was like, well, first you have to create a username and password. And he's like, how do you make money? What's your business model? And I looked at him and I was like, oh, we're a nonprofit. We're, I don't want to make money. I just want to make the world a better place. And he <laughs> looked at me and he was like, nobody here is going to fund you. And um, I just thought he was like the meanest person in the world. Uh-huh. And he gave me his business card and he said, um, you know, email me your business plan and I'll take a look at it, but no one here is going to fund you. And I, I, I remember looking at him and saying, well, Tyler, um, I don't care because tomorrow I'm going to start a Kickstarter. And he, he looked at me and he's like, that's not how Kickstarter works. <laughs> and fast forward, all of the other investors that thought I was so amazing, um, obviously that went nowhere because everyone was just telling me I was great so that they could be like, let's take a lunch meeting. Let's do a dinner meeting. And right. they went nowhere. And because I paid $80 to pitch, I had emailed Tyler my business plan because I'm like, I paid for this, so I might as well get his feedback. But I went and took these meetings with these other investors and um, they, you know, they just led nowhere. Um, I ended up taking a meeting in Hollywood uh, with this guy in his office. And um, I just uh, remember he had made me like a video And it was like people helping people help people. And I thought it was the stupidest video. And he's like, I'm going to invest in this. It's going to be so great. And this and that. And his office was at the very top floor of this building. And um, it was all glass. And so all of his employees were leaving. And then, um, and this was like around five o'clock. And then it got later into six, seven. And, um, I remember just like him working with me and then standing up and like whipping it out in my face. Like, I'm going to fund your business. Wow. So, you know, pay up. And um, that was like the last investor meeting I took. I know that none of you guys watch porn, but just in case you have some friends that do, you're going to want to hear me out on this one. With everything going on in the world, governments have increased their surveillance. They're using your devices to track your location, your movements, and in some countries, even your internet activity. You don't want to be caught literally with your pants down, and one of the best ways to protect yourself is with ExpressVPN. When you use ExpressVPN, your internet connection is rerouted through a secure encrypted server so you can surf the web anonymously without anyone looking over your shoulder. I know you think that all you have to do is use incognito mode and everybody won't be able to tell that you've been lurking on plug talk at work, but you're wrong. Even when you use incognito mode, your internet provider like Verizon or AT&T can see every single website that you visit. And if you live on campus or use a shared Wi-Fi, your network administrator can too. 
That's why I use ExpressVPN whenever I go online and I recommend that you do the same. Without ExpressVPN, you're giving people a free license to peek over your shoulder and see all the freaky shit that you're looking at. So protect your privacy today and get three months of ExpressVPN for free. Visit expressvpn.com slash no jump. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash no jump for three months free with a one year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash no jump to learn more. Thank you. What'd you do? I froze. I was in total shock and I kind of played it off like, um, I played it off like um, I wasn't upset because I was scared of what he would do. And um, I, I just tried to get out of the building. And he did like grab me and he was very aggressive. But um, aside from that, nothing happened. Like he touched himself and he touched my face. And I like kind of pushed him off, like laughing and joking around, like wow. not a big deal. But that sucks. That's yeah. At least you got out of there. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of my wake up moment of, oh, when people tell you that you're great and you're smart doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean so my thought of, oh, Tyler's an asshole for telling me I'm unfundable, um, turned out like Tyler was right. And, um, so he had emailed me back my business plan and it was all highlighted in red and all these notes. And, um, so I took a year where I didn't meet with anybody all of 2015 and I started working, um, I took uh, Wharton Business School, put their business courses on Coursera for free. Mm -hmm. um, so I took a bunch of their business classes and I worked on the feedback that Tyler had given me. And then a year later, I emailed him on t the anniversary of the day we met and he told me I wasn't, you know, fundable. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, happy anniversary, Tyler. Not sure if you remember me, but... Um, you know, here's my revised business plan. So it was a year later that I had sent it back to him. Mm -hmm. And so he booked a meeting with me in San Diego and I went out to see him. And after that, like he started working with me on like mentoring me and guiding me for what next. So he's like, okay, well, now that you have your business plan, um, you have to answer two questions. Can you build it? Number one. And does anybody care? And mm -hmm. if you can answer these questions, then you can get funding. And so, um, I didn't know how to code. I didn't know how to program. So I started, um, uh, I had a background in virtual reality. I was working for a friend's company and, um, I, I started joining hackathons and learning how to code on YouTube. And, and this was all with the idea being that it would help with this business that you were building that was essentially about helping people who are addicted to drugs. Yes. Yeah. So I wanted to do that. I had the idea in 2013, but I wasn't active in it. It was just an idea that I wanted to do. And it wasn't 2013. It was not virtual reality. In 2013, what I want, what I was trying to build was a learning management platform. So it's like um, video calls online, kind of like what people do now. But right. it was also like uh, what you see for online courses, but for therapy. So you oh. get like assignments and stuff. And then um, very early on, a friend uh, put a VR headset on me and, um, you know, I was so impressed and I didn't see entertainment or gaming. I saw planting a memory in someone's mind and being able to enact something without the consequences. Uh -huh. And I wanted to scale that in mental health. And then the more research that I had done, I started following professors um, that were doing this for a long time and I ended up connecting with them and going to the universities to meet with them and um I that became my passion but but so I'm like a fentanyl addict and I can just do fentanyl in virtual reality and that'll kind of like soothe the desire to do fentanyl no. right that sounds kind of counterintuitive <laughs> right like so what what is the idea though I'm, okay uh so that's exposure therapy what we do is number one I don't treat anybody. That's another thing that I'm canceled for. I don't do therapy on anyone. I build the tools and then the therapist, uh, clinical psychiatrist use them with patients. And so um, a lot of our tools are mindfulness based. So you don't necessarily need a therapist there with you, Right. Um, which is like guided, med guided meditations, guided coping strategies. Um, but then when it comes to exposure therapy, what you're talking about you need a therapist in the room. And so 
the way that that would be is um, you wouldn't just be thrown into, you know, a virtual crack house or anything like that. And then you've got fentanyl in front of you. Um, What we do is the therapist um, does the work with you initially. And then um, at a point when you're ready, they'll start to do mindfulness practice. Like they'll put you on a beach. And then uh, so you wear a belt around your um, right under your chest It measures your heart rate. And we also do the voice analysis. And so while you're in, engaging with a therapist in this environment, um, he or she will ask you, Adam, is it OK? So they'll see that you're doing well while you're talking about this issue or you're doing poorly while you're talking about this issue. And so if you're not doing well, they're going to keep you in an environment that's calming. If you are doing well and you're talking about you know, these things, then they'll say, Adam, is it okay if I put you in, um, you know, like an environment that like, for example, um, at home by yourself. So we'll put you at home by yourself, like in a living room environment, there's no one else there. The therapist will go quiet. They'll measure how you're feeling, ask you to describe how you're feeling. And a lot of times people will be like, I feel fine. Like everything's good. But you can see on your wrist and the therapist can see on the computer that you're not okay. So your distress level levels are at elevated. And so you're able to kind of gamify the therapy and see that a lot of people think like talk therapy doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. I just need medications. Well, if you can see stress and you can see calm and your therapist can say, Adam, remember what we talked about? Drop your shoulders. You're breathing from your, you know, you're breathing from your chest, breathe from your belly and then um, and then see how long it takes you to calm yourself down until they need to like step back in again. And so now you can actually measure a therapy session, not just based off of what you're saying. And if you're doing well in the environment, then the therapist will say, is it okay if I put your drug of choice in front of you? Mm -hmm. If you say no, they're not going to do it. If you say yes, then so they can escalate. We also um, we also do this with veterans So um, something that because I didn't design the scenes, we went off of what the therapist told us they wanted to do um, because they already do these therapies where they have them like imagine these scenarios. But now we can bring it to life. So, for example, um, Fourth of July or New Year's Eve, um, a lot of veterans end up relapsing because of fireworks. Right. And so I didn't know that. I didn't know that either until, you know, I started this. So. Uh, basically with um, with this, you can put them at home by themselves, like in an environment. So we've got, uh, you know, places that are nicer, but we've got places that are not as nice. And so you could choose the environment, you could put them in, and then you could set fireworks off and you could put your their drug of choice in front of them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the things that um, has shockingly been... Um, very effective is bathrooms we have bathroom stalls we've got dirty bathrooms we've got clean bathrooms we've got home bathrooms you would not believe like how triggering bathrooms are for people Mm. and i guess it's because they cut themselves in the bathroom they throw up in the bathroom they'll do a line in the bathroom um so 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 the gist of it is that basically if you're trying to stop being addicted to something that it's like going out into the real world is very challenging because you're just going to be exposed to all this stuff. And, you know, if you're an alcoholic and it's hard for you to be around alcohol, like at some point you're just going to walk by a liquor store and that could be really hard. So you try to like build up their tolerance level. Yeah. And you want to measure it. So I don't want to just go based off of how are you feeling? I'm fine. Well, now I can actually measure it. And that's the, that's the biggest problem with um, insurance companies, right? These are the things that I get attacked for. Um, Why are you working to make insurance pay for treatment? Why shouldn't you be working to make treatment cheaper? Well, there are facilities where, you know, there are facilities that cost like $55,000 a month. And then there are facilities that cost $20,000 a month. And it's like when you look at the levels of care, you have 200 people packed into a place, not enough therapists. Nobody gets one-on-one therapy. It's all group therapy. It's you're you're decreasing the quality of care and the type of work that it takes these people to go in and deal with suicidal people, deal with really aggressive people, deal with people's trauma. Like you get very emotionally attached to people when um, 
they're sharing like such personal sad stories with you and you really want to help them like you take that home with you whether you like it or not you're going to get attached to those people mm -hmm. you want them to succeed so it's a very hard job and i'm i'm definitely anti lowering the cost of treatment because and the other reason is like if um you go in like let's say you need a kidney transplant that's going to cost around four hundred thousand dollars you're not going to pay for that insurance will pay for it if um cancer treatment costs on an average of one hundred fifty thousand dollars insurance pays for it mm -hmm. a heart transplant costs about 1.5 million dollars insurance pays for it but insurance will not pay for mental health or addiction for more than 30 days because there's no concrete anything besides Adam says he f feels like he needs more time. Right. Well, why am I paying 45000 a month? And then on top of that, after 30 days of treatment, the relapse rate for alcohol and opioid addiction is 90%. Mm. So after I spend an average of $45,000 on Adam's treatment, there's a 90% chance he's going to relapse. So if Adam's saying, I need more time, your success rates are so low, they're 10%. Why am I going to give Adam more time? But if we can say... When Adam first came to our facility, he was a 9 out of 10 risk level to relapse. And on day 15, he was, you know, a 7 out of 10. And on day, um, you know, 28, he was a 6 out of 10. But if you extend another 30 days, then we can decrease that even more. And then, and then more so, you can get information like um, Adam's able to get himself down in stressful environments from a level eight to a level seven on his own, but he needs the assistance of a therapist still to get to a level five, you know? Okay. So, so you this can is actually the use science. Of, right. So this, exactly. these, these are the goals with the, the business. It's and it, just progress tracking. It's right. measuring. And so we also have a, an application, an app, um, and that app is a telehealth app. So when you go home, you can do video calls with your therapist, but it's not just a video call platform because... Um, it takes what we do in virtual reality and smushes it into your phone. And the reason for that is like video calls are great for physical health. If I have a stomach pain um, in the morning, I'm doing my telehealth session. I'm going to tell my doctor these are my symptoms of how my stomach's hurting. Um, at night, I'm going to have the same symptoms. For someone with mental health struggles, they're going to wake up in the morning and say, um, you know, I feel really great. I'm really excited. I think today's going to be, you know, a better day for me. And then by evening, they could just want to end it all. Right. So it's really important to constantly give them that support. And so the freaks come out at night. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, so, I used to get fucked up. Yeah. Nighttime. Yeah. That's when you get fucked up. Yeah. And so I think the most important aspect of that is you really want to um, track the uh, the progress progression or regression of the patient and so essentially we're trying to treat mental health like physical health mm. and I can tell you all of the people that are attacking me right now are have not read the petition because from day one I've um, I've outlined every all of my goals in a petition on change.org and um, that petition doesn't mean that you have to use my company's technology I'm trying to pave a path where, Others will essentially use technology the way that I'm using it. Just like we, we use diagnostic tools and stuff like that in physical health. Why don't we do that with mental health? Right. So, so you guys, so now we're okay to talk. You get to Mark basically because you saw him as basically having a platform that speaks about mental health to a lot of people. So it might be a good fit. Yeah. Um. So... You know, I've been trying to build this business. So I, you know, this guy tells me, can you build it? Does anybody care? And so I'm like learning how to code. I build a really hideous version of what I'm trying to build. Um, I take it to a clinic. The clinic actually likes it because it functions. So then they give me money to start building, um, you know, to hire people to help me. So now I hire a, a little tiny group of coders. Um, and then where, you know, they're, they're building it for me. And um, I'm having like ups and downs with the company because I still need a business model. Who's going to care enough to. And at the time, it was only virtual reality because um, that's what I specialized in. And I had 
dreams of building the telehealth aspect, but virtual reality was not covered by insurance and telehealth was not covered by insurance. So I was trying to pave the way for something new and investors just want to see a return on their investment. So if you don't have a way to make money off of the product, then they won't, um, you know, they won't really move forward and put money down. Right. That's what I was going to say. Shark yeah. Tank, you don't see a lot of nonprofits, right? No, no, no. That right. was when I was totally oblivious completely right, okay, right? Yeah. i just thought oh i have a great idea someone's gonna write a check for me and partner up with me and teach me how to do it and right. that's absolutely not how startups work at all i learned that um but yeah so um i build the platform i start the company shut it down o originally i decided to um originally my first company was called the last star mm -hmm. and uh, my focus was on treatment um rather than punishment. And so uh, when I was trying to do the does anybody care factor, I would go to courthouses and I would sit and wait to talk to a judge because I didn't know how to talk to a judge. And um, none of the judges would talk to me. And I'd have like all of these like surveys or something just so I could say like, would a judge be willing to sentence someone to treatment using my progress tracking? Like you can track them with the parole officer and all of that to see that they're doing like their mental health assignments and all of that, mm -hmm. is that something that a judge would even care about? So it was um, really focused on treatment over punishment. And then I couldn't get a judge to talk to me. I couldn't get into the correction side of things. Um, I, I just, no one would have a conversation with me. And um, so then that obviously I shut down and then I started up again, um, but I was I was getting a lot of um, I was I was telling my husband, I'm like, no one's taking me seriously. So he told me he's like, put everything, you know, on Instagram. So I started posting stuff on Instagram, not my pictures, but just doing reviews of technology. And people thought I was a guy and they'd be like, hey, man, um, you know, what do you think about this camera or that camera? And so um, I was getting a lot of traction on on Instagram. So I got invited to speak at a panel. Um, at a conference, somebody reached out to me on Instagram. They're like, Hey, would you be interested in coming to our conference speaking about cameras and technology? And so, um, I went, uh, they wanted me to talk about virtual reality and that panel opened up doors for me where people wanted me to talk more about what virtual reality could be used for. Mm -hmm. And so I started speaking at conferences and, um, essentially planting the seeds for mental health. But then I had a couple, um, I had a lot of access. I was working for a friend's company that uh, was filming um, 360 experiences for really big productions and sports teams. And so I started um, Telesport Me. Uh, I was really proud of the name. But it was uh, training in virtual reality. Um, and so that got a little bit of traction. And then I had an investor that was willing to write a check for that. And when it finally came down to taking money for it, I was like, if I accept this investor's money for Telesport me, then I'm going to be stuck doing virtual reality in sports. And that's not what my passion is. Mm. So I shut down Telesport me and um, essentially I ended up starting Aura. And that was in 2019. So I had like a lot. And throughout the years, I've had a lot of mentors. I've had I've when people when I would pitch somebody and um they would tell me like no to writing me a check to invest in the company. No would just be the beginning of the conversation. I'd say, okay, well, why no? And um, then they would tell me, well, because of this and this and this. And then I'd go fix all those things and come back. They'd be like, well, still no because of this and this. And I'd go work on it. And so 2019, I got to a place where I had a strong business model. I had a strong product. Um, I, I, um, had interest, I was able to say that I could show that I could build it because I had a platform. And does anyone care? I had treatment centers that were lined up to start, you know, using the product. Um, and uh, I ended up raising a little bit of money through a pre seed round, so mm -hmm. smaller investors. And um, that allowed me to hire a team, build out the platform, and um, we were uh, giving the product to treatment centers for free, not charging them in, in exchange for the clinical teams to co-develop with us. Right. Um, 
And so this is 2019. So we're giving everything away for free throughout 2019 in the hopes that we'll eventually be able to charge so that while I'm burning through all the cash from the investors to pay, to make payroll for my team, that I'm going to be billing these facilities down the line, right. right? March 2020, I'm supposed to start in our agreements billing these facilities, uh -huh. 19 treatment centers that are signed up. And um, COVID hits and all the shutdowns happen. And I get these calls from the facilities saying they're not comfortable using virtual reality because they don't want to put the headset on somebody's face, wipe it down, and then put it on somebody else's face. And so um, no, nobody wanted to do virtual reality at that time with COVID because everyone was like super strict with like social distancing. Um, there's a company called Cleanbox where you could put the headset inside of this box and it'll like sanitize it. And we offered to buy all the facilities, the clean boxes, and they all refused. Um, and so essentially, uh, it did open up a lot of doors with telehealth. So all of a sudden, video calls with therapists and medical professionals were now um, reimbursable by insurance. And so I ended up burning through the rest of the money that I had to build our telehealth platform. So you could do the voice analysis, the biofeedback, uh, the behavioral analysis and all of that in the application instead of in a VR headset. Uh -huh. So now you have patients using their own phones instead of putting something on, on their faces. So that like burned through all the cash, but my contracts originally were for virtual reality. And I was like, now I have a product. I have investors that supported me. I have no, no like... I'm about to run out of funding and nobody cares about what I'm doing. No one will take a meeting with me. COVID investors are mm. terrified to like put their money anywhere because the market was so crazy. So I was like, how do I get people to care about me? How do I get people to care about my mission and what I'm doing? Um, so I reach out to Mark and I tell him what I do. We get, uh, we have lunch in, um, in LA. So I, I flew into LA for something work related. Mark and I connected, we had lunch. And then the next day or during lunch, he was like, do you want to do a talk on my channel tomorrow? Mm. Um, and so we decided that it would be cool if I helped somebody, um, from his channel. And I actually had a few people that I wanted to help because um, I had watched a few of his videos. I don't know if you know who Ronnie is. Mm -hmm. She was like a young girl that it, her story is just very heartbreaking. But there was a, a few like um, men and women that just seemed like they really wanted the help and they just didn't have any like proper guidance in their life. Um, so I made Mark an, a little list of people and he said, why don't we let the public decide? So in my first interview, um, we basically just let, um, we told the viewers to vote for who they wanted um, in the comment section. And overwhelmingly, everybody was like, Amanda, 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 Amanda. So I was like, okay, who's Amanda? So then I look her up and... Um, How many interviews in was she at this point? Because didn't you do like... She had a lot. She had a lot. There was a lot of material. I didn't even know it was the same woman when I saw. Yeah, um, that, that was a crazy moment for me as well to realize like, oh, the, all those thumbnails. That's yeah, all, yeah. the same person. Um, And so I actually called Mark and he he he's cut this out of our interview before because he wants me to seem like a saint when in actuality I called Mark and I said, can we pick someone else? Not Amanda. And he was and I told him I was like. Amanda's really severe and I'm doing this for free. Like mm. I'm not charging for my time and Amanda doesn't want the help. Um, and cause she was about as far gone as you could get as an addict yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I had a list of people that I wanted to, to help that I really felt emotionally connected to their stories. Um, but number one, like, Amanda was very far gone and she didn't want the help. And I knew that to get her to even start step one, I was going to have to start going to court and getting the courts involved. Mm. And um, Mark told me, he was like, well, you said that you could help anybody. And if you help Amanda, then you'll win people over. Right. Um, so 
I told him I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And um, I started when I connected with um, with Mark about it. Like when I when I originally found out who Amanda was, um, Amanda was already in jail. She had attacked her father, and um, Mark instructed him to call the police. But they didn't really know what they were gonna do mm-hmm. from that point on. And uh, when he told me that she was already in jail, I'm like, okay, I can go to court for her. Um, but that's another thing. A lot of people are saying uh, when Amanda was not well in those previous interviews, she had made a statement that's right. that's About like her dad? no, oh. well, yes, but like she made a statement, and the statement is, uh, I don't want no girl my age video gaming me. Oh right, yeah. And that that apparently to the internet is evidence that I was following her around on Skid Row with a VR headset trying to get her to do virtual reality. So what were you actually doing? I didn't know her at that time. Oh, you didn't even yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even know her at that time. Um because when I met her she was in jail. Right. Um so um she was in jail and all of her teeth were missing and her jaw was dislocated and her face was like a balloon. Like she was super, super skinny. Right. It was really, really sad. Like, um, I couldn't understand what she was saying when she would talk to me. I thought she had permanent brain damage and I wasn't sure how far I would get with Amanda. Um, and this and, is who you're supposed to help rehabilitate. Yes, yeah. And so, right. um, I, um, You know, the other thing that I'm canceled for is I made a statement, conservatorship or jail. And basically these people are saying the only way that Lima, uh, the only like the only way that I advocate to help people is if you have somebody that needs help, you either, uh, you know, set them up to go to jail or um, you put them in a conservatorship, you know. And so um, I was actually talking in terms of amanda's case um you know number one i don't believe in ever setting anyone up but i definitely don't believe in enabling somebody if someone attacks you if someone does something to you then you should you definitely should call the police because even though it seems like a betrayal to that person if that person comes and attacks someone else and that someone is not willing to like petition for treatment for them they actually want judge justice for them to go to jail then they're in trouble but if they attack you and you're saying to the judge hey i know that um you know uh i i just want them to get help i'm willing to do this and this and this and so the amazing thing that i was trying to show with amanda is anyone can do what i can do i'm Mm -hmm. not a doctor i'm not a lawyer i'm I'm literally just using community resources that exist and I'm telling everybody how to do it. Right. And so, um, what I was advocating for was something in Los in, in California called an LPS conservatorship. And that's a conservatorship of mental health. It's equivalent to the guard to a guardianship. It doesn't take control of the, the estate. Not that Amanda had anything for me to like control, but, um, in terms of property, she didn't have any property. But an LPS conservatorship is only for mental health. They only run for one year and then you have to renew them and the court needs to find additional evidence. So it's like the equivalent to conservatorship or um, a guardianship. Mm -hmm. And so um, from uh, from there, I had prepared all of the paperwork to show that this is a mental health case. It's not a criminal case. Amanda's father would come with me to court. Um, and he was essentially, um, you know, saying the same thing, like, yes, yeah, she attacked me, but I don't want her to go to jail. I want her to get help. And um, we had found a treatment center that was willing to accept her. But because the damage to her brain was so severe and I wasn't sure how capable she was of understanding the severity of the situation, um, I was trying to explain to Amanda, um, if you run away from treatment, you're going to go back to jail so um we delayed the so she was in tr- in jail for two months and i could have had her out a couple weeks sooner but she stayed in jail and i was calling her all the time saying hey um just remember you're gonna like you're gonna go- come back here if you run away from the treatment center um and then we once we got her into the treatment center um you know 
it was a really sad situation. The other thing that people are upset about is that Amanda gained weight, you know. Um, Why would they be upset about that? They're saying uh, Amanda gained weight under Lima's care. Um, she was really skinny and uh, Lima made her fat and that's why she died. And but I, usually if you see somebody who's <laughs> all fucked up on drugs and they gain weight, it's because they get off drugs, right? Well, number one, uh, she was on medications from treatment, Okay. right? I mean, like she's prescribed her, her medications from her doctors. That's a separate situation. Uh -huh. Um. But like, uh, I'm not a doctor, so I can't say what gains weight or what doesn't. But in general, um, some medications have that effect to like uh, put on weight. But that was not Amanda's issue. Amanda was the same weight that she was before she was using drugs. I'm gonna be real with you. I think her weight is the least, of, or was the least of her problems. Like, why the fuck would anybody be focusing on that? Um. Like, clearly her life was, like, hanging by a thread yeah. at that point. Like, focusing on her, her weight seems kind of... Well, the public sentiment uh, towards me is you should have left Amanda alone. And Mark and Larry would have said the complete opposite because myself, Mark, and Larry were the only people in her life that were actually trying to help her and actually... Um, sorry. Like, I had, I had to dress her for her funeral, you know? Wow. And like these attacks started, um, not even, we didn't even have a year to grieve her passing. And I had, um, a very close relationship with her because she didn't have any other family aside from her father. Right. I was talking to her every single day. I spoke to her right before she passed away. Like she had called me, um, and we were talking about, you know, um, moving her, like, uh, I, I was asking her like, um, you know, what she wants to do um, does, because she had started school. So I had gotten her a laptop and um, she wanted to be a certified nursing assistant. So we got her the book to start studying. Um, we were enrolling her in online classes. And how long was she clean for at this point? Um, at this point, she was clean for about, I can't remember the exact number, but roughly 250 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. She was clean for that long. Yeah. And then she relapsed and that's when she, she passed away. She did not away. relapse. Um, she passed away in the facility, not a facility I own because I do not own a rehab, uh -huh. but um, she passed away um, a few days before she was supposed to step down to a lower level of care, which is basically living as, in a sober living or living on campus or living somewhere and then going to a program five days a week. Right. Um, and so, so what happened? That's a big question. Um, so... She passed away in her sleep. I had gotten a phone call from Larry, um, and he was, like, hysterical crying. And it was Mother's Day, and my husband and I were visiting his mom in Chicago uh, when I got the phone call. So we were having, like, brunch with his mom. And um, I got this call with Larry just calling me, and I couldn't understand what he was saying. And then, and then like, I made out what he was saying is, Amanda's dead, Amanda's dead. And I'm like, Larry, that's what are you talking about? Like, I didn't even take it seriously. And he, um, he was like, they called me and they told me Amanda died. And I told him, I'm like, Larry, that's impossible. I just spoke to her. Like, there's no way. Sorry. No. Um, so I was calling the facility, calling, calling, calling. No one would call me back. And then the CEO called me and said, Hey, Lima, I'm really sorry, but Amanda passed away. And we, um, that that team loved Amanda. Um, you know, she was there for quite some time, and um, she she had watched the videos of herself later on, like not at the beginning of when she was at the treatment center. And the staff told told Amanda not to show the videos to anyone because they didn't want other patients to judge her for like her past. Mm. And Amanda didn't care. She was like. Uh, there was a girl that was trying to leave a treatment center, like discharge against medical advice, so leave early. And um, her parents told her that if you finish treatment, I'm gonna, we're gonna buy you a car. And Amanda, Amanda was in such shock that this girl was gonna leave the treatment center and go relapse, and that her parents were willing to buy her a car. And they, she was like, 
look at these videos of me. Like, do you want to end up like me? And sh she ended up pulling this girl into t like to the side. And she was like, do you realize like how lucky you are that your parents are going to like take care of you and do all this stuff for you? And, um, right. you know, and so she would she would often like show those videos to people, to, like convince them to stay in treatment. And um, anyways, so she just became like a, a part of the family at that facility. All of the all of the staff knew her. They all loved her very much. She had like her chair and group, um, which when she passed away, um, they put flowers on the chair she used to sit on, the other patients. Right. And then um, another girl came and moved the flowers and sat down. And like a fight broke out in the middle of group therapy oh, because wow. it was Amanda's chair. Um, so like there was a lot of um, people that really loved and cared about her. And, um, you know, that was so when I when I had spoken to the medical staff and asked them, they told me that, um, you know, aside from her medications, Amanda only had Tylenol in her system. Fast forward, it was aspirin, not Tylenol, because they they um, which to me is not a, is not such a big deal of me announcing ty Tylenol versus aspirin. I mean, they're very similar, right? I've pretty much yeah. taken them interchangeably my but whole life. But they're not the reason. None of that is the reason that she passed away. And so, um, like, once she passed, um, the, like, uh, coroner took months to get back to us and kept coming back with, um, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then Mark and all these, you know, people like donors and everyone would be hitting me up and saying, why did Amanda pass away? Why did it like what's going on? Do you have don't you think it's weird that you don't have an answer yet? And so then um, we sent uh, like um, my colleague sent an email to the coroner because I didn't want to be the one interacting with the coroner directly because I had felt that I was um, like backtracking when I first got Amanda into treatment how unfiltered do you want me to be on this podcast? <laughs> Real unfiltered. What? To, <laughs> okay. Throw a turd at you or something? When, no, no, no. When I first got Amanda into treatment, um, I ended up... So it, it was a really bad time in my life. So I had, like, no money for my company. I didn't know how I was going to make payroll, right? This is, like, end of 2020. Like, uh, mid... I can't... Roughly October, so I didn't know how I was going to make payroll. Um, I um, was having issues with my sisters. Like they were just doing really, really poorly and mm. they kept ending up in the hospital or near dead or whatever the case was. Um, I had an incident where, um, oh, the facility that Amanda was at in California was $40,000 a month. And the woman kept texting me like, when am I going to get paid? When am I going to get paid? And I told her, um, you know, that we would pay her that month. And so I went on, on Mark's channel and I announced that we're going to help Amanda. And so um, I was expecting, because there was such an overwhelming amount of people that were asking for that, that we were going to get a lot of support and we were going to be able to pay for her treatment. And so um, I ended up raising $1,500. <laughs> Off, off this GoFundMe that you announced on Mark's me. channel? Yes, and it was attached. So I started um, a scholarship program, and um, the money all went to giving.org. It's an it's a fiscal sponsor. It's a nonprofit. They collect the money, and they manage it so that it never touches my hands or Mark's hands. And I felt that that was the most transparent way of doing it. Uh -huh. So when we say it's going to pay for medical expenses, giving, we submit the receipts to giving, and then giving pays the medical facilities and um so this lady's texting me she's like um uh why uh i need to get paid or i'm releasing amanda and then on top of that the backlash that i had gotten when i announced i was helping amanda was uh amanda's black and this lady's white and this lady's trying to, to take advantage of the black lives matter movement <laughs> and um uh whatever like it was a shock okay the fact that she's black seems very unimportant in comparison to the fact that she was blatantly addicted to drugs and was spiraling out of control right 
it was a shock. <laughs> I mean, it was that's a, just it so was a crazy. Shock. And if you uh, look at that interview, um, like it was an overwhelming amount of negativity pouring in, um, basically about that, white entitlement. Right. Like I would think so much more of the average software underbelly viewer, to be honest. Like I would just think that they were like largely a community of people that were like pretty reasonable. And then I, I hear something like that. And really, like, I was just reading the, the comments on your new interview on Software Down Rebelly, trying to get, like, a grasp of what the main complaints are. Yeah. And, I mean, well, I didn't I didn't really see the Illuminati thing so much. But I, yeah. but I don't really see, like, real arguments. I just see, like, yeah. she seems like a liar. Like, some people just yeah. seem to be convinced by your, your mannerisms, I guess, maybe that. <laughs> I uploaded a video today that got not the best response i mean i haven't checked on it since i uploaded it but i titled it uh, i looked up t channel mm -hmm. <laughs> to see like what they titled their videos and i titled it um lima from aura is in big trouble and it's basically me reacting to some of the ridiculous things that people are saying like uh what? lima's not my real name and right you know, lima is a country <laughs> basically right would you um, uh lima is a bean some people would say some people, you know what? Okay. Some people will like be mean to me in the comments and be like, uh, go kill yourself, Lima Bean. <laughs> it, but like my best friend in high school, her name was Ashley. Mm -hmm. um, I can't find her. I don't think she has a Facebook. So she's if she's out there, contact me. <laughs> but any, any Ashley's to, watching this, tap <laughs> Any Ashley, she used to call me Lima Bean um, when we were in high school. It was just the cute name she had for me, so that doesn't offend me. It just right. reminds me of Ashley. Right. But I just think that's funny because no one that actually likes me calls me that in the comments. Mm. Um. But, okay, my thing about it is, like, and when I was watching, like, okay, would you say there's, like, a ringleader of this? Or is it is yes. it kind of, right? Yeah, so all of this really started, um, well, the first wave was just totally random. It was um, random people saying that... Uh, I was racist because Amanda was black. But right. if I but if I was helping a white person, they would say I'm racist because I'm not helping a black person. <laughs> that that so is a good point. Yeah. There's no way I could win that. And so I'm getting text messages constantly from, um, you know, um, this lady that owns the treatment center in California saying, we're releasing Amanda, we're releasing Amanda. Well, if they release Amanda, then she violates her court order. And then she's going to get arrested when they find her and she's going to end up doing time. And then I will be known my reputation as the white woman that put a black woman in jail right. when I'm trying to say this is how you help someone. Um, because, so, you could, because you didn't have $40,000 a month. Yeah. Right. And and I couldn't raise the money. Like it was only 1500 that we had raised. I, so. I think we really got to call out Mark <laughs> for all this because he set you up with the impossible <laughs> task of like not. I mean, I'm not going to say impossible, yeah. but let's be real. It's like if you took a thousand addicts and put them in a room, yeah. it seems like Amanda might honestly be the worst one. Like she was like, yeah. it was really, really bad to expect that you would have been able to write the ship that she was sailing at that time. Well, I did tell Mark I could help anybody and I was extremely confident. And uh, by the way, Amanda is not the worst case that I've dealt with. Right. I've dealt with people similar to Amanda, but I, so then, so for me, if I didn't think I would, I could help Amanda, why would I put myself in front of millions of viewers and say, okay, I'll take this case on? Do you think you're I a little idealistic? It. No, because I do, I do, I did help her. But it seems like kind of a common thread because when you talk about you telling the, the Shark Tank investors about your nonprofit, that it feels like maybe you have at times thought that you, maybe you're a little overconfident in what you could bring to the table. Oh, definitely you have with, a streak of with that, when perhaps. I first so when I first went on Mark's channel, I was very idealistic. Right. And uh, when this woman was threatening to release Amanda, I didn't have money to make payroll for my for my company, for my team. And then on top of that, um, my sisters were just getting worse and I couldn't help them. And when people are like, Why can't you help your sisters? Well, helping my sisters would cost 45,000 a month times two, 90,000 a month, and I can't afford to pay it. But if I can demonstrate with someone, like I thought if the audience picks somebody and helps to pay for their medical bills, then we could, and, and I use the word case study, and people are like, oh, Lima's experimenting on Amanda. 
I and if you actually watch the video in its entirety, because these people are not watching my videos, they're watching conspiracy theories clipped together with to catch a predator music right. in the background. Because okay, there <laughs> there is a ringleader. I'm, I'm not sure if you want to name them or whatever, because maybe that would. I mean, I'm sure anyone who wants to find it can find it, but yeah, it's such. It's so not serious in the way that it's being reported. Like when they're when they're putting this stuff together about you. And I'm gonna give you one example. And I, I okay. kind of call it like okay. Shane Dawson style editing because <laughs> I used to watch Shane Dawson and he would he would do this thing with editing where he like walks into a room and it's like Jeffrey Star has all these fucking Gucci purses yeah. and he's just like oh oh and he acts so shocked and like the music <laughs> is like shocking and like he just does so much to make it seem like he's looking at something shocking when in reality it's like it's it's a bunch of fucking handbags or whatever it's like shane you're a fucking millionaire you're looking at a bunch of twenty thousand dollar bags it's not like th there's no reason for you to be reacting like this but he does it to hype up the video <laughs> yeah. and i'm watching the video about you and there's one point where they're showing footage from her funeral and you're going you're, you're talking and you like you you name aura you name the charity yeah and she she stops it and she goes i am shaking did she really just name her charity? I am shaking. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's not like, like the, that is not something that should be so shocking. Like it's, it's it would seem kind of, I, I mean, I, yeah. I would agree that like, you know, you over promoting it or like being really crass about it, of course, could be kind of weird. But like the, the clip that she showed was not shocking or weird in any way. Yeah, it was but this me is, renaming. That's like her whole video. It was me renaming the scholarship. Uh, that was my goodbye speech to Amanda. It was basically me saying I'm renaming the scholarship right. uh, to Amanda's Light Scholarship. So mm. any funds, the like any funds that we raise are going to be in Amanda's name to help somebody. Right. Basically, as like her legacy, because she was very important to me and I was very close to her. And um, I just think it takes a lot of like mental gymnastics to be able to frame that as negative. Yeah. I don't I don't understand. And like the these are people that are not watching everything. They're not watching the full videos to their entirety and they're omitting a lot of interviews. Like when they say her father abused her, um that Yeah, because video, she, she took that back at one point. She and... she admitted that and she was mortified. You don't understand how many conversations she had with me. Lima, can we film with Mark? Lima, can we film with Mark? I'm like I like I I would I lived in a different state so I would go visit Amanda right um I wasn't treating her I was not her doctor um but like um I never took pictures like very rarely took pictures to like update the donors and stuff but I spent a lot of time with her and she kept saying can we do an interview can we do an interview because she wanted to take back what she said mm. and I kept telling her don't focus on that focus on your recovery so if you look at how many photos i took with amanda it was very rare because i didn't want to like be talking to her about something and then pull up a picture and like let's take a selfie you know mm -hmm. um so uh they're admitting the fact that she had taken it back and also when larry reached out when mark reached out to larry um it, he had reached out to Larry because at that point he already knew that what she was saying was not true because she would say everybody's a molester. Like she would literally accuse random strangers she's never met before. She'd point them out and say that person's a molester, according to Mark, you know, she would. And then at that point he realized and she also um, stated that her mom died in a fire in the same interview that um, that she called her father an abuser right she said my mom died in a fire and her mom is very much alive i met her mom so um it's it's absolutely not the case you right. know um but like why would that be a lie but that is the truth and she's also in that same interview calling her father in a molester and her mom is dead she's also saying that the government is following her <laughs> and she's also saying that someone's video gaming her right. and then she's saying that there are clones of her and people are saying that I was video gaming her and that the clones of her are um, clones of her in virtual reality that I cloned. And you guys should watch Amanda and listen to her because she was trying to tell us something about Lima. But we all thought she was crazy. And that's in my um, Lima is in big trouble video. Who are these people? <laughs> like, it just feels like the most bizarre. It feels like coming up with conspiracy theories yeah. has just been like 
so normalized that this just seems like a, a, a normal use of these people's time. It's kind of mind blowing to me. It it's uh very but if you also think about it with COVID, everyone was just like Netflix and chilling. Yeah. And then you have like, you know, the um Tinder swindler right. and uh like the us uh, my m- someone killed my roommate or my roommate's a serial killer or whatever these like shows are that are like true crime or whatever. And people just have gotten addicted to it. And I think, you know, people have become very cynical and they're just searching to make, you know, these stories up. And But I see it in rap all the time where if there's any level of ambiguity about how somebody lost their life, like, Mm -hmm. like there won't be weird conspiracies if, the person got shot in the head in the middle of downtown and there's photos of their their body laid out but if there if there's any kind of mystery about what happened the people just latch onto yeah. it and just come up with these crazy ass theories it's 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 just become so normalized and like you know i went into this interview wanting to be objective and to kind of like you know really push you on like are you really the devil or whatever but i I'm, thought you were gonna be really mean but, to me but i just that's really, why i showed up in a no jump for sure <laughs> i know and that is a very interesting tactic i'm not <laughs> sure i've ever had anybody do that before but respect <laughs> um but it, i just really have like struggled to find any kind of thread that seemed valid about you having ill intentions for amanda and that's the really sad part is Um, I went into debt to help Amanda. I, you know, it took a lot of my time, a lot of my life. And, um, this all started out of another conspiracy that they had created. Um, but like just backtracking to when that woman was threatening to release Amanda. So, um, she's, she's telling me I'm going to release Amanda. I, um, I can't pay payroll. I cannot, um, Like, my sisters, I can't help them, and they're getting worse and worse. And um, I, like, I only raised 1500 to help Amanda, and this woman's threatening to release her. I was helping someone, and this person uh, cracks uh, a glass and cuts herself, and she cuts me with the glass. And she had let um, a hair, like, a homeless man inject her with heroin before that. Uh, So this was, like, I... I try to, I mean, my husband gets upset because he's like, you're always in like these risky situations trying to help people. But anyways, I was kind of thinking that too. I was, I was thinking these are the situations you end up in when you're like very, very empathetic and like (laughs) are willing to take on these sort of projects because like I I lived uh, and, and had a bike shop downtown for a couple of years. And I learned pretty quickly that in terms of my interaction with the homeless and the drug addicts and stuff that I was going to, you know, hey, how you doing? But I wasn't, I'm not giving anybody any money because they're going to keep asking you for fucking money. And I'm not going to like reach out to try to help somebody like that. Like a a huge percentage of people down there are just kind of like, they're probably going to be there forever. Let's be real. I mean, I never give money to people. What I do is I'll make like little bags with blankets and food and I'll put a card in there with hotlines that they can call to get help. Um, but you a, I just... You got a big heart. I would not want somebody giving my sister money because I know that that, that money could end up causing an overdose and killing her. Right. Um, and you live downtown. You just... You see it and you know. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, I, I know you're not going to fucking buy a piece of pizza. I know what you're doing with this. Yeah. And, and like, you know, at the end of the day, it's just so common that the point is, like, we need to start helping these people instead of just like enabling them and that's the one thing that i'm like completely anti anti enabling people to harm themselves Mm. um and i guess that's what's like polarized people with me so because they're very like the people that are against me are very liberal like you should be allowed to do anything um you know (laughs) it's like i'm sorry but i don't want my sister doing anything to the point of where i'm at her funeral like i want i want her to get help even if she doesn't want the help and eventually she's gonna be grateful i mean like the idea like yes you can do whatever the fuck you want and obviously you know amanda exercised that till the end but i mean the idea that it's wrong for you to want to help somebody or wrong to push them like like it it starts with this overall belief that there's nothing that nothing is real and that there's no objective good life and that everything that everybody goes through is just kind of up in the air and then it ends with the idea that 
you're wrong for trying to help somebody. It's just fucking well, madness. it's also like why would why would Lima want to help? Obviously, there's an angle, and that's the thing that the internet cannot understand. And if you want to know why I would help, just to read the petition. You know, like right. it's literally laid out so that insurance companies pay for my sister's treatment so that somebody like enough people care because one person alone, I can't get a meeting with an insurance company. But if a hundred thousand, a million people sign a petition saying, listen up, United, Kaiser, all of you guys like you need to start treating mental health like physical health. And there are ways to measure if someone's getting better or worse. Right. You know, um, and so it, it's um, it's been like completely crazy but um in terms of like uh when amanda was at the first facility in california and the lady was trying to get her uh telling me that she's gonna um you know release her and i was like oh my god i'm gonna be known as the white woman that put a black woman in jail because that's literally what the internet is trying to say um you know i'm racist for helping amanda so i'm gonna give you some life advice yeah don't ever spend a moment of your life trying to make woke people happy because yeah. by definition they are permanently unhappy well this was my my very first experience of that because <laughs> yeah. i thought i was gonna go on mark's channel and be like we're gonna help somebody and everyone's gonna be like let's you know let's do it and then who do you guys want to help and then they're gonna be like amanda and then you know uh here's the money to pay for amanda's treatment and i wouldn't like after that, I'm just, you know, going and visiting her and giving fun little updates. But that wasn't what happened. So on top of all of like the other chaos, I got cut with this glass from this random girl. I, um, you know, uh, I have all of these these drama the, with my business and everything else. And then this woman's threatening to release Amanda, which would, you know, go against her court order. So I made a rash decision without talking to my husband to take a very large loan out to pay for Amanda's treatment. Mm. And um, I ended up sending the funds to the woman so that she doesn't release Amanda. And then I worked it out with a facility in Las Vegas to transfer her over there because they were work willing to work with me on the payment since she was going to be there for a very, <sighs> like a pretty long time, not just 30 days. Um, and so um I went to court in California, requested that she be moved to that other facility, gave them the address. They approved it. I have all the paperwork. And then Amanda was uh, taken not by me, but through like the facilities and the court orchestrated, not me, to this facility in Las Vegas. And so um, uh, I ended up in debt with the situation. And um, but I knew that when people saw that I was actually helping Amanda, that they would, um, that it would start raising money and I would be able to pay the loan back. And my husband found out that I took this loan on top of all the other drama I was going with debt in my company and all this other stuff. Um, so we were arguing the entire time and I had this massive loan and I felt like the entire internet hated me. Um, but I, I, you know, like, I just knew that I was going to be able to, I mean, I, I ruined Thanksgiving that year. Um, things just got, things were just so shocking to me that um, I just decided to give up. And I, I've i never had a suicidal moment in my life, but I was like, I'm just going to kill myself. Really? I've never said this, like, only a couple of my friends know. But um, so it was Thanksgiving 2020. And, um, you know, my husband and I were fighting about money. I felt like I lost my sisters. I didn't know how I was going to maintain Amanda in treatment. Um, it, everything was just falling apart. I was like, I can't make payroll. And I don't know how to tell my team. And so um, I I, um, <laughs> I, took a lift to uh, a bridge in downtown Chicago, and I left without my jacket, and I told my husband. He was trying to give me my jacket, and we were arguing the whole time. And I was like, I don't need it where I'm going. And he called the police because he kind of understood what I meant. And obviously his whole family's there. Super embarrassing. And then I got to the bridge and I the realized... The Lyft driver's family was there? No, 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 no. My husband's whole family was there oh, for Thanksgiving. Right. So we got married in 2019. Uh-huh. And this was 
like our my like Thanksgiving with his family as us being married. And <laughs> this is like the right. introduction. And so um, I took a lift from the house because we were arguing. Plus, like all the other stress I had, I'm like to the bridge to the bridge in Chicago. And I um, I'm like, I'm just going to kill myself. So I get to the bridge and it's so low. And I'm like, if I jump off this thing, I'm going to survive. And then we're going to have helicopters. <laughs> and then everyone's going to be like mental health founder. I'll probably end up on the no jumper uh, Instagram account. Yeah. Mental health founder, CEO jumps off the bridge, you know. <laughs> That's cool that you're so tapped in that you, so. you perceived the meme before it happened. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no one will ever trust me to like do anything ever again. No investor will ever, you know, back me. Probably so, not. Um, Suicide attempts get no be bad way. For no, it would ruin everything. And so confidence. I ended up going back. Um, I called my husband and he came to get me and I went back and. I remember staying in the, in in the room for three days. I didn't want to face his family because I was so embarrassed. Um, it was awful. Like, anyways, so I, that was when I ruined Thanksgiving in 2020. The way I see it, my <laughs> honest opinion, yeah, is that you seem like an extr- like a lot a lot of the people in these conversations. They think that you're a really selfish, terrible person who's pretending to be empathetic. I see you as somebody. Who, who seems like you're like empathetic to a fault in the sense that I think that you really need to rein it in. Like, you you, you know, like that situation you're describing, it just seemed like you just took on way too much yeah. by just being kind of idealistic. Like, I really think they have the wrong idea yeah. about you. And I wonder where that comes from. I feel like a lot of people, they see a person doing something virtuous or, you know, taking on a virtuous, you know, mission. Yeah. And they like just maybe that like kind of makes them feel bad about themselves because the average person just is not doing anything like this and like and then they look at your failures and like to them this is proof that you were all bad the whole time and it's like well i mean if you try stuff you're gonna fail you're gonna fail you know? so it's at the end of the day like i've dedicated my life to building something and then you have people that have dedicated their lives to destroying what I've built. And that's the most shocking thing of everything. For like a couple hundred thousand YouTube views, which is so yeah. crazy. Because it's like, like, I mean, just such a small reward. It, it makes me feel like everything is fucking Alex Jones now. <laughs> my, my, YouTube, my Instagram account was shut down for like a month and a half because oh, really? they mass reported me for child pornography. Jesus. So that's a whole nother thing. Instagram's <laughs> it was shut down. Um, and then I was locked out of my Facebook. Um, they've mass reported my YouTube channel, like, you know, and before I wasn't very active. Like I've probably on average posted on YouTube three times a year. Like I'm, I'm going to start being more active now cause I want to take back the narrative of my story online. Right. But, um, uh, yeah, like, Fast forward when Amanda does her final interview with Mark. Um, it It's phenomenal. Everyone's so shocked at how much better she's doing. The GoFundMe goes from uh, 1500 to 37000 mm. And so I'm like, oh, great. We're going to keep doing interviews and showing her progress, showing her going back to school. And you felt like this is going to kind of save pay. your yeah, whole so, shit, right? So essentially I pay up front, and then when giving – pays the treatment center then the treatment center will reimburse me that was the original deal right um and then i'll use that money to pay back the loan Mm -hmm. um so i never actually would get access to donor funds and then amanda passes away and there were there was like uh all i got was like an outpour of support like people telling me i'm so sorry for your loss thank you for everything that you did for amanda um and then at that time oh uh Prior to that, I was reaching out to people um, because I've worked with like quite a few public figures and help privately with their mental health. So I was reaching out to people and asking if anyone would share Amanda's GoFundMe to help me raise money so I could pay back this loan. And um, one of my friends, a couple of my friends have mutual friends, like me and Bam Margera got connected. All right. And so... Uh, we were talking on the phone or FaceTiming and this and that, and I was talking to um, his wife, and um, we were going to do a social media collaboration. And so the agreement was that um, I was going to give him a shout-out on Mark's channel, 
and on my Instagram and say like, thanks so much for supporting me. Like go, go follow Bam and Nikki. And then Bam and Nikki were supposed to uh, get together with me and um, film, like I sh was showing Bam like how our technology works and Nikki and um, then they're supposed to put that interview on Bam's Instagram and share Amanda's GoFundMe in like his bio. And right. so we were doing an Instagram collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I went to do the, so like I, I was living in Washington at the time. I flew out to LA, filmed with Mark, posted on my Instagram, went out to San Diego, went to film with Nikki and Bam. And it wasn't the type of footage that I was comfortable using because it would have just been very exploitive to their family. And I, from that, I could tell he wasn't well. And I wasn't following him on Instagram. And w when was this? This was uh, a little, a couple months before Amanda died. Because, okay. So this was the beginning of 2021. Okay. Because, okay, the, the thing with Bam is that he just recently did like Steve-O's podcast. Yeah. And he's sort of like proclaiming victory over his addiction and everything. And, and then it just came out of TMZ like a day or two ago that he's like fully off the wagon. Out, they got footage of him partying and all this stuff, so... You were, you were he wasn't sober at that time because they said he was in so, a sober living house or some shit for like a year plus. Yeah, so like the thing the thing with Bam is like this whole free Bam situation. I don't know how familiar you are with it. Another lunatic Has online really, movement, isn't that that's shit the same, crazy? The same woman that started this. Um, uh, really, Lima killed Amanda. Le so she wow. said that the post, me saying thank you, Bam, for supporting me was that Bam uh, invested in my company and then I put him in a conservatorship to take the rest of his money. Right. And um, he was never under a conservatorship. And, you know, I'm, like I said, I have a lot of mutual friends. I'm friends with the parents. Like, we run in the same circles. So um, when, uh, when Amanda had, so, like, when we did that, like, Instagram collab that I never used, mm -hmm. um, I didn't talk to them for a little bit. And then I started getting phone calls like, hey, can you help? Can you help with Bam? Can you help with Bam? Um, and, you know, that's like his story to tell. The way that he tells it is pretty funny. But um, essentially, like, I kept saying, like, no, I'll tell you guys what to do, but I won't get involved. I'll tell you guys what to do, but I won't get involved. Because Amanda had just passed away. Mm -hmm. I realized that I was stuck in this debt. I promised Ivan that... I was not going to get involved with any more stuff like this because not only am I running a startup and spending a thousand hours a day running a business, but I'm also dealing with like crisis calls and situations. And I told him I'm going to focus on our family and I promised him that. And then things just escalated uh, with Bam's situation where again, like I'll let him tell the story, but Nobody wanted to be his legal guardian because that would require you saying no to him. Right. And I was basically just a human shield. Um, so it, it, nothing about being the guardian was advantageous to me. It was just uh, uh, I get to be the person that Bam hates when I say no. Like, that's not a good idea. Right. You know, well, that's um, what a lot of celebrities need is just somebody yeah. to say no because they they ha they go out of their way to surround themselves yeah. with enablers. I was just, when I was talking to Steve-O, he was saying that that free band movement was like totally counterproductive, that it was totally oh, insane. Oh, it's ruined a lot of things. Like, um, BAM was originally under a one-year court order treatment, and then the free BAM movement just like escalated things, and people keep telling him like, imagine this, right? You go to a treatment center, and so like at the very beginning, Bam and I are fighting all the time, just like when Amanda, Amanda didn't like me at the beginning because she wanted to go out and do drugs. Like right. she didn't want to be in treatment. And so um, fast forward, like I would tell Bam all the time, I'm like, you can, um, you know, you can hate me all you want right now, but eventually we're going to be best friends. And now like he always jokes around with me like, oh, you've moved up. You're best friend number 10,000 mm. I'd be like okay well if I need something from you how am I get, how are you gonna find me in, in between 10,000 people you know mm -hmm. but like um for for him he goes to a treatment center and 
he's being told by random patients like, oh, did you know that Lima um, is stealing your money? Oh, my God. Did you know that the courts are rigged? The doctors are tricking you. You don't need treatment. What do you need treatment for? Like, and then I have to get on the phone with him and be like, look, you need to do this for your son. Like, you need to get your family back. You need, you, do you know what I mean? Like, you need to do this for your health. So in a private case with a private person, the courts, the doctors, the um, everybody is saying the same thing. The family, they're all saying, like, we want you to get better. We want you to get help. In Bam's situation, he has all of these people trying to save him from me, and they're trying to hurt me by causing him to relapse and sabotage himself. And that doesn't hurt me. It just, of, of course, like, it. I'm sad for him, but it hurts him, like, it hurts him and his son is going to turn five and he's going to get to a point where he's going to realize his dad's not there. And, you know, his relationship with Nikki is is shaky because like they need to work things out and, and he needs to take his recovery seriously. And he's trying his best. Like he really, really is. He really um, it's just a really sad situation with all of the confusion that's going on. And like, I feel for Nikki and I feel for Bam and I feel for his parents and um, it's, it, it's, it's sad. It's crazy because when I was watching him on Steve-O's podcast, he's talking about his addiction as if it's like, it's over. Like, I'm, I'm good now. I realized I just can't drink. And Steve-O is kind of like, Steve-O is somebody who I think has the, yeah. the right attitude on his addiction where he is actually terrified of yeah. relapsing and he lives his life as if he's fucking, he wants to avoid things that are going to tempt him. He wants to avoid potential triggers and stuff. When he walked into our studio and his manager smells weed right away and he kind of like just pulls us aside right away. He's like, Can, we don't want anybody smoking weed around him, yada, yada. You know, it's like he really like goes out of his way and he acknowledges that he has this beast inside of him. And with Bam, it was just like, immediately trying to act like it was like nothing and that this was just yeah. a thing in the past i'm like bro you haven't even been sober for well, that you long have, you have to understand that like bam's getting mixed signals because he's not really getting to do like straight up therapy and get all the information from everyone because he has like so many yes people around him which are just like mm. fans and other patients that are like telling him you don't need to do this you're right. not you don't have a problem oh my god you're bam you you're like a skateboard champion and a celebrity <laughs> and whatever like you know and it's just like um and this is this this is unrelated to bam but just in general when you have somebody that's been put in, on a pedestal like a celebrity it's an, there's another layer because you get all this validation from people and then you become addicted to the validation that you get like the attention and people l coming up to you as fans. And um, it's like, you know, people just need to be more respectful about the fact that you're talking about somebody's health, you're talking about somebody's family and you're talking about things that you don't know because there's a lot of things that th these people don't know. The guardianship was separate from the court order. Mm. Um, there, no, like it's none of anybody's business why the court order happened. It's up to Bam to share that stuff. But at the end of the day, um, it's it's like another level of enabling for for him. You know, just like the public saying, like you don't need to get help. You don't, like everybody's tricking you. Um, there's a giant conspiracy. Oh. Here's something. Um, that woman posted videos of April uh, talking to the police about um, an incident that happened where she was, uh, I can't remember exactly, but, um, you know, those patients were showing him the videos and saying, don't trust your parents, um, this and that. And it's like April literally showing genuine concern for her son and being really emotional. And it's, again, Nobody knows what happened in that situation, mm -hmm. and um, they're they're literally taking police body cam footage and blasting it out and making a a conspiracy or like a story behind it. It's really sick. It's very sick, and it's really sad to watch a family get torn apart. And people watched Phil and April on, you know, Jackass. Like they've they've grown up with them, so maybe they feel like entitled to just 
being a part of the process but um you know you need to like treat these people like real human beings that beings and like um i don't know it's like i i've um i've i've dealt with some really challenging cases but in bam's situation his mental health and his like case is not as severe as some of the other people like amanda's situation Mm -hmm. but the toxic thing is is like the free bam movement and this cult following of people that's like determined to get their way and they have no insight they don't have any medical records of his they don't have any insight and and what what is the end result is like somebody is is making is making a living off youtube as a result of just making these bullshit fucking videos it's really crazy man like uh, uh, learning about all this has maybe decreased my confidence in humanity overall i would say me too certainly in the software underbelly audience me too. Damn. I mean, it's um the the only evidence that anyone would have to say that like Lima's an awful person is uh the autopsy report because I essentially stated in um Mark's video that I'm going to uh read exactly what the doctor gave me and I read uh seizure disorder. Right. And um, this woman got the autopsy report and was like, look, Amanda died of uh, a a cardiac arrhythmia related to schizophrenia. And so um, so they're like, Lima lied about the autopsy. And this is the funniest thing for me. If Amanda died of something related to schizophrenia, wouldn't that be good for me in a sense so I could say we should treat mental health like physical health and then she dies of something related to mental health. So I'd be like go, going around blasting that and be like, look, she died of something related to schizophrenia. But no, none of these people making their conspiracy videos have what I actually read. Mark wouldn't just let me read something random. Right. Like I forwarded Mark the email from the doctor. I was like, great. This is what I'm going to read on on your channel. Literally, the email is straight from the doctor. Um, I have zero reason. It doesn't t- it doesn't affect me what Amanda passed away from because I wasn't physically there. And, um, you know, in terms of the autopsy report that she's reading, it's missing a bunch of information, which she wouldn't know because um, she doesn't have all of Amanda's medical records. And it says that there's no evidence of traumatic brain injury. And anyone that knew Amanda or anyone that watched the videos know, knew that she was violently raped and beaten on several occasions where she lost most of her teeth. Her jaw was dislocated. She had a lot of brain trauma. She could barely talk when I met her. Like, um, And the first facility that she went to uh, said that because Amanda had previously only been in facilities for like a couple days and then released... So she'd get in there high, she'd be talking to herself, and they'd be like, oh, schizophrenic. And so once she was in a facility for a longer period of time, um, they were like, they, the, they reached out and said, like, Amanda doesn't have schizophrenia, that was drug-induced. Right. And so when I got, like, when our team saw the report, like, It, it's like a shock to me that they didn't... So th- I guess they didn't have the medical records. The coroner that performed the autopsy did not have the medical records from the facility in which she passed away from. Mm-hmm. And I didn't say that in Mark's video because I'm not trying to throw blame around. Um, but I too would like a proper death investigation to be done by Clark County. And I am... I would like Clark County to release an official statement. I've had my attorneys reach out to them. And, um, you know, I also want answers. And the the woman that started the Bam Margera conspiracy theory of me being a conservator, which is not true, or the, um, you know, fact that I, um, like, uh, hurt Amanda, like, a real journalist would get the Clark County report, attempt to reach out to me and say, hey, I have this. Why did you lie about it? And then I would have reached back out to her and said, hey, I didn't lie about it. Forwarded her the email that I got. And I'm like, 
great finding. Let's reach out to them together and figure this out. Right. You know, I mean, that's how that's how it should have worked. And we could have probably been really good friends. But she reached out. Um, she made videos saying about how uh, Lima's going to sue me and I'm going to draw this out so much and make sure that she runs out of money and blah, blah, blah. And I'm a lawyer and I'm going to represent myself. Right. Because you are suing. She her, hired, right? Yeah. She hired. Um, I requested a retraction. And I gave her the actual facts of what she was saying. Right. And in that retraction uh, demand letter, it said, when well, my lawyers drafted it, it basically stated, like, she accused me of stealing the GoFundMe money, the $37,000. So I basically, the accusation was that I killed Amanda for $37,000, um, which would be impossible for me to get from giving because they are a reputable nonprofit. And uh, Miley Cyrus uses them for her nonprofit. So it's not like they're just like a no name. They they actually have a lot of credibility. But um, I corrected her and like, well, my lawyers sent her the demand letter stating that um, I actually took out this much of a loan and this is how like I'm in debt this much from having to pay it back. I'm paying it back on my own. Um, they corrected the fact that she said I was taking money from BAM and said that um, I actually never charged for my services. I helped the family out pro bono. Um, and like uh, the autopsy report is stated that I didn't lie about it. I actually read, um, you know, uh, what the doctor gave me, all of that and requested a retraction. And she refused and and uh, put up a video. Uh, Bam's guardian threatens to sue me retraction video right. where at the end of the video, she accuses me of taking an investment from Bam. I don't know Which if I've ever seen anybody in my life who seemed more transparently like grifting for YouTube dollars than, than this person. To and be then honest. she she uh she she opened up a personal GoFundMe, and I've never had a personal GoFundMe, um, and raised twenty five thousand dollars within like the first twenty four hours. She did. Yeah, her goal was twenty five, I think, and she raised it within like a something like a day. That's amazing. Yeah, I don't and I couldn't even raise um. I raised 1500 over months. <laughs> right. So, but yeah, like, well, that's what happens. You polarize people. Right. You get them to really hate something. And then you like the Trump strategy. Yeah. You know, it's pretty sick. So it's crazy. Um, um Okay. Yeah. So I am going to look like a fool if you do end up being the devil. But okay. as far as my <laughs> judgment on all this, yeah. I ain't buying it. You seem like a good person. Thank you. I understand why Mark uh, continues to support you. I think that there's a stark raving, mad, lunatic mob on the internet that's out to basically terrorize innocent civilians for content. And I think that uh, a lot of these women should be locked up because they're sick in the fucking head. I really... Um... <laughs> you don't have to be, you don't be on board for <laughs> the entirety of what I just said. But from what I could tell, this thing that we're discussing yeah. is like... Info wars for chicks. I don't. Oh, this is just uh, uh, reputation destruction, like yeah. mean girl syndrome, high school drama. And it's um, the sad thing is, I mean, now a bunch of people are making videos about me using this girl's videos right. as a source. And um, it's it's uh, it's like it's spreading like wildfire. Bad news spreads faster than good news. But at the same time, um, you know. I I uh, I can't remember what my point was. I had a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah. You know. So I'm, we're I'm, gonna I'm, survive it. Yeah, you're gonna be all right. I mean, yeah. in reality, that person probably should not be allowed on yeah. YouTube anymore. Oh yeah, I remember what I was gonna say. The people that are making all these videos about me, I feel like in real life we could probably be really good friends, but. They're just going about the wrong way of getting information. And if they can do this to me, then what else are they publishing on their YouTube channel that's not factual? And how are you how are they harming other people? So it was like a really rude awakening for me. And I really urge people to do their own investigation. And I am I did file um, a complaint like moving forward with a lawsuit against the woman that did this. Um, because, um, you know, the Internet's calling for an investigation. You cannot sue for defamation if you're wrong. Like, I won't win if there's truth behind her ac accusations, which means that the court has to investigate everything. Like, did I take money from Bam? 
Uh, did I have anything to do with harming Amanda? Did I lie about the autopsy report? And calling me names like weird or awkward or whatever is not defamation. You guys can make fun of me or whatever, but calling me a criminal and a scam artist and a liar and a murderer and all of these things is defamation and it's totally untrue and I'm opening it up for the court to investigate. So I think that that's the best way to handle it. And again, um, you know, I'll let Bam speak on his experience with me, but I would also let Clark County clarify um, why I read what the doctor, um, you know, sent me and why the report was not amended and also why they act, why they came up with a death investigation or why they came up with a cause of death without having all the facts or without having all the records. I'd like to have that answer. But, I'm with you. Yeah. Hopefully uh, this was entertaining. Hopefully we, <laughs> hopefully I made People a didn't... few, because you know what's funny about this too is that I saw a friend of mine, I was like not planning on doing the interview because I thought that it was too just deep in the software underbelly yeah. lore that I was just like, is this really like, this seems a little far away from the type of stuff I normally carry yeah. cover. And then I saw a friend of mine, he goes, you got to interview the devil. And <laughs> I'm like, who are you talking about? He's like from software underbelly. And I'm like, I'm like, Oh, you watched that video. He's like, yeah. And he was like, he was pretty much like on board with what you're talking about. And so he yeah. might be kind of uh let down that I didn't end up buying for it, buying yeah. it. But well, hmm. I actually, I came prepared like, I did have a nervous breakdown in the car because I was like, I don't know if I can do this. I'm going to embarrass myself on Adam's podcast. Yeah, but I think you did all right. I was, well, I, I thought that you were going to come at me like trying to make fun of me and, and, well, you know. believe me, I, I was trying to find, like, I was trying to figure <laughs> out what the case against you was because, you yeah. know, it's like if we're going to have a conversation, I need to be able to try to represent that yeah. case. Yeah. It, it didn't didn't have any legs from what i could tell yeah seemed like almost all of it was pretty ridiculous but anyway thank you for coming on thank you for having me for sure where should they go if they want to uh, tap in with everything that you have going uh well my instagram is lima from aura my youtube is also lima from aura and my video of me reacting to some of the crazy things is called uh lima from aura is in big trouble so I'm going to start addressing all of this in like little breakdowns on my YouTube channel. But my goal is to get experts to chime in um, and discuss these, not just me on my own, because obviously that hasn't been working out. Don't yeah. give up on yourself. Thank you. I think you got a long way to go. Thank you. She's going up. Lima, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, Instagram, etc. Like, comment, and subscribe. NoJumper.com if you want to support. Appreciate you one, guys. Wait, one last thing. Yep. And also the merch, because Mark's channel has been like heavily demonetized. Heard that. We filmed our video uh, two weeks ago, and when he uploaded it, it took two weeks to actually go up on his YouTube channel. Really? It was just like waiting there because they wouldn't approve it. So definitely, like, make sure you support the podcast by That's true. NoJumper.com. Thank you. Also, Patreon.com slash NoJumper. Appreciate yes. you. Thank you. You, you yeah. reminded me to shout out some shit I didn't remember. Thank you. Thank you.